Hello everyone, my name is Rob, welcome to episode 1 of the Kinetic Rugby League podcast. So there's a few different topics to get through today, we've got some different topics to cover, we've got some hot takes to go through, and some Rugby League fan questions that were submitted on the TikTok account, so if you want to follow that, you can check the link in the description down below, and you can kind of submit questions over there, or even in the comments of these videos, and we'll kind of cover them um, in future episodes. But let's crack on with the first topic, shall we? So the first topic I wanted to cover was Hull FC. Now I understand that this wave has kind of gone a little bit with everything that's going on, but there's always going to be changes with Hull FC. And it's a topic that obviously needs my it needs my input, so why not? So at this moment in time, Richie Myler has been brought in as the director of rugby. Tony Smith has now left, and there was an announcement this morning, or it might have been yesterday afternoon. I can't remember, didn't get much sleep. Um, Gareth Ellis has been brought in as a development coach or is helping to develop uh, in some way at Hull FC. So a few changes there. So I wanted to talk about potential replacements as a coach and players that they could look at to rebuild a spine. So if I'm in charge, what areas am I looking at? Who am I looking at? What's realistic? What's a little bit out there but has potential? So in terms of coaches, there are two that I've written down that I think, based on the pressure that they're under at the moment this season could be without a job by the end of the year. The most likely I've got on this list is Rowan Smith. Because of the amount of pressure that he's under from Leeds fans and the expectations from Leeds as a club, just the up and down nature of this team over the last couple of years is not the level of stability or competitiveness that a lot of Leeds fans and probably Leeds as a club want. Granted, they have got a grand final appearance in there, and there are definitely times where they sort of peak and they have really consistent moments and they are usually competitive towards playoffs like they can start competing for playoffs but they need some stability they want to be back near the top winning trophies Rowan Smith isn't really providing that so there's a chance that they move on and with the dip in performance recently I don't think he's going to go yet but I think he's got a couple weeks and if the performances are lacking against midfield teams and even against bottom three teams, so right now that's Casford, Hull FC in London, especially Hull FC in London, but um, as of right now they haven't played Hull FC yet. That's tomorrow as a time of recording. Um, <clears throat> but he's under a lot of pressure and I think he's most likely to lose his job next. He's up on the chopping block. The next most likely that I see after that is Paul Wellens. I've seen a lot of Saints fans call for him to be fired, especially after the Wire game in the Challenge Cup sem uh, quarterfinals. I apologise. He's under a lot of pressure given the success that Saints have had over the last five years. The expectations are insane. From Saints fans and Saints as a club, they have such high expectations and the squad has had some changes to it, but not so many that he's not inherited a grand final winning squad a four time grand final winning squad so he's in a pretty good position but if he's not producing the trophies there's a good chance he's out of there so Hull FC's replacements I think could be Rowan Smith or could be Paul Wellens most likely Rowan Smith and both as we know or as we can hopefully agree are at least Super League level coaches and you know Rowan Smith may want to go back to Australia, he might choose that, um, Paul Wellens might just want to stay around St Helens, obviously he played there for a, an extremely long time, I couldn't tell you how many years it was, but he might have his life completely set up there and doesn't want to change that at all, but Rowan Smith may have a little bit more flexibility in that area, because he might not be so locked down in Leeds, or maybe his house is a good good distance between you know Leeds and Hull, for the drive, that kind of thing, so he might not need to move around as much. So it just depends on what the coaches want to do, but those two as an option are solid Super League coach options that if anyone in the league needs a coach, they're a fair option to go with. You know, they're not doing a great, you know, particularly great job at their clubs right now based on their expectations, but would be decent options to go with. So that's kind of the coaching route that I go down. I think Rowan Smith would do you do fine at Hull FC, at least try and turn things around. But looking at player options, let's start with the spine that they, they had this year, which is ridiculous to me. It was Tex Hoy, Morgan Smith, Farmanu Brown, and Danny Houghton. 
which is a joke. That's three hookers in a spine. I don't care what anyone says, that's three hookers. You ain't going to do anything with that. Morgan Smith is not a Super League halfback. Maybe a Championship halfback, but he's not a Super League halfback. As a hooker, fine. Farmanu Brown is not a Super League halfback. He's a hooker. He's an in he's a New Zealand international hooker. So why has he been wasted at seven? If anyone watched the Pacific Championships and saw Farmanu Brown, they would have seen a very enthusiastic, energetic, pacey, dangerous player that really competed extremely well against two strong Pacific Island nations in Samoa and Australia. I almost forgot, but it was Australia was the other one. So he competed extremely well against Samoa and Australia at number nine. And now we're going to put him in at number seven because we think that anyone from Australia can just adjust. Like, the two players that come to mind that I know can play halfback and hooker, Rob Burrow, because he was one and then became a hooker, but then Michael Monaghan at Warrington could do both, but typically played as a hooker, but could play seven if needed. So, he's not Michael Monaghan, and he's not Rob Burrow, but he doesn't need to be, because he's a great number nine, and you're just wasting him. Now, granted, Jake Drummond um, is still injured at the moment, has been for a very long time, and maybe he would have been a difference maker at this point, but based on what you've got available, you would have been better off just putting a kid in from the academy. Play Farmani Brown at nine, play a kid from the academy. But in terms of a rebuild, there are two players that I can see as a very, or one's a very realistic inclusion, very realistic, and that's Josh Drinkwater. Given, I believe, he's off contract at the end of this year for the Warrington Wolves, He's an experienced um, number seven. That's kind of what Hull FC need. They need an experienced number seven. But my only concern on their behalf is that he doesn't offer what they need. Experience as a, a tagline is good. Experienced rugby league player as a tagline is great. But in terms of the quality he offers, it's not what Hull FC need. But it feels like something that they'll do. Like, they'll just take him because he's available. Ah, we need a seven with experience. Who's available? Drink water. Do it. And it's just... It's not going to be... It's not going to be enough for them. Because his kicking game leaves a lot to be desired. Um, the accuracy of his kicks. Uh, the distance. Uh, the de decision making with his kicks. I can go into specific detail, but it would just be a waste of time at this point. But he hasn't got a running game. I've not seen many of those loop passes over the top. What I have seen a fair few times is a very decent short-range kicking game. So he's got that, but you kind of hope that Jake Truman would have had that, but maybe Truman in the future would take on the general kicking game, and maybe Drinkwater would focus on the short-range kicking game. This is, of course, all hypothetical. So Jake Truman, I'm assuming, would be the starting number six, and Houghton would be the starting number nine. But the fullback position is an interesting one, because... I know a lot of Hull FC fans, they like Davey Litton, from what I recall, because they wanted to drop Tex Hoy a little while ago and have Davey Litton. But I think there's a player that's in Australia right now that's a real option. And he goes by the name of Will Price. Now, the main reason why I think Will Price is an option, okay, he's at the Newcastle Knights right now. They had, a like, when they brought him in, they had a lot of players in the spine. It included Lockie Miller, Will Price, Caelan Ponga, Jack Cogger, Jackson Hastings, Tyson Gamble. Six spine players. They, of course, then um, lost Miller to Leeds. And... Caelan Ponga started at one. He wasn't going to be dethroned. Jackson Hastings was assumed to be the starting number seven. And Tyson Gamble the starting number six. Jack Cogger then comes in for Jackson Hastings after he's dropped... Then I think Tyson Gamble may have had an injury at some point. I can't quite remember. But Caelan Ponga is now out for months. Will Price wasn't getting any game time in the first team. Is getting some experience in the training sessions and possibly in reserve grade. Caelan Ponga is now out for months. And they announced the team list 
for this week, and they announce David Armstrong as the number one. So Will Price, I'd assume, is sitting there thinking, what more do I have to do? I'm getting regular minutes in Super League, being hyped up by people in my own country, and now I've gone to Australia, and I'm not even the first in line to take over Caelan Ponga. There's this many spine players, and they go with David David Armstrong. Will Price, I think, also wouldn't be opposed to a move to Super League, most likely. We see a lot of players go to Australia for a year and come back, or Australians come to England for a year and go back. It's not that unlikely. So, I think there's a world in which Will Price would want to come home if this year doesn't really work out, and it's not really the experience he expected, but I think if... If next year's spine for Hull FC could be Will Price, Jake Truman, Josh Drinkwater and Danny Houghton, it'd look pretty solid. And the last player I want to mention is Stefan Ratchford. I think they could maybe bring him in on like a sort of player coach role, but more as like a in an influential position where he's just trying to build up the professionalism of the of the youth players. And he's there to kind of set a tone. To kind of make sure that everyone's focused. And also, it can fill all sorts of positions. Fullback, if necessary. Centre. Uh, standoff. Scrum half. Hooker, if necessary. Or loose forward. Or just be the 18th man and just be ready to come on if and when needed. I think he can fill a very good role just purely for influence around the team. But that's kind of... That's how I'd look to rebuild Hull FC. The next topic I wanted to get onto was kind of Super League in general. I've sort of wanted to get onto the rules and, and referees, IMG and the quality of play. So starting with the rules and referees, there are still definitely complaints, but what I will say is I'm glad that it has improved over the last couple of weeks and we don't have these ridiculous decisions like we did early on. Of course, the Farm Army Brown is one of those, um, or his the decision against him against Warrington is the one that I'm referring to, but there have been other ones as well. Um, Watts uh, was another one, and there's been a few really dodgy sin bins and red cards in the league, but that has really died down over the last couple of weeks, and we haven't seen so many ridiculous decisions. I feel in some areas, they have been consistent. Now, since that uh, rule change or the wording change, there has been... A decent level of consistency in kind of the the high tackle area. Some of it is a little bit questionable because we understood that any contact with the head that looks intentional, you know, is a sin bin straight away. I am glad that that's died down and there are less players being given sin bins, but still sometimes the application... It's a little bit too subjective from time to time, but again, I am glad that we've had less sin bins. So it's it's still not perfect, but it is definitely better than the awful, awful decisions that we had in the first three or four weeks. So I'd, I'd like to think that we can all agree that that wave of stupidity has now passed. We are in a, a smaller wave of stupidity with some of the decisions that are made, but less than this tsunami that we had. In the first few weeks. So that's definitely an improvement. Um, the one thing that I noticed that referees have been consistent on. Is incorrect play the balls. Like it's the player's responsibility. As soon as they've put the ball down to, to uh, roll it back. If they lose balance. Unless they're dragged down. But if they lose balance themselves. And don't have full control. That's an incorrect play the ball. That's the one thing that I've pretty much seen all refs very consistent on. So... That's something. Um, It is funny though sometimes. I think we need to be careful with the kind of abuse that we give to referees. I understand that, look, if you think that a certain ref is a supporter of a certain club, I I get it. I absolutely get it. Um, But there are some moments. I remember it was Wigan were away against Lee. Bevan French went in for the second try of the game. And there was a, you know, it was an unsure moment. So the video ref sent it up. Uh, so the referee sent it up to the video ref, but he sent it up as a try. And a Lee fan came to the front of the stand and started screaming abuse at the referee. Now, I didn't hear what was said. There was no mic to pick it up. But based on you know lip reading, it didn't look nice at all. And I'm just thinking, a human being made the decision to move up to another human being 
to scream foul abuse at them for saying that something was a try because this Lee fan probably thought there was a knock-on in there somewhere. Turns out there wasn't a knock-on and it was a try. So this Lee fan is screaming abuse at a referee that got a decision right. And it sort of reminded me of something else. It's a little bit off topic, but I'm an Everton fan as well. I know, God help me. But I'm an Everton fan. I was watching the Merseyside derby the other day. And there was a moment where Calvert-Lewin was offside. And the referee, linesman, pulled his offside. And there's a bunch of Everton fans in the Gladys Street end. Screaming, vile abuse. And I could hear some of the words that they were saying. Because obviously they have more mics around the pitch. Hearing what they were saying. All the grown men in the crowd... Screaming this level of abuse at another grown man for giving offside in a football match. And he was right. Calvert-Lewin was clearly offside. He was a foot offside, maybe two feet offside. And he's getting pure abuse. I don't understand the sort of violent reaction towards referees. I understand getting frustrated. I get that. But the level of abuse that referees get is just on a completely different level. It is, it's way too over the top. If you want to criticise for the referee's performance, fair enough. But if you, as an, a human being, really want to lay into another human being just for getting decisions wrong in a rugby league match or in a football match, you are a joke. Just so you know. But I've gone a little bit too far on that topic. But other things I wanted to talk about, IMG. I think, you know, they've had a few years now, but I think at this point they've done they've done well. There's a few things that have really improved. Of course, having more games televised or every game televised has been really helpful. I do feel like there's a good feeling around the growth of the sport at the moment. And there's a couple of things that they've done as well. A few more posters Um, In public, some things on uh, Northern Rail trains, Uh, you see advertisements there. In terms of viewership on YouTube, I think that's increased quite a bit as well. So that's always helpful. I think clubs have a few more followers too. So I think the overall um, exposure of the sport has definitely increased. Not in the Championship or League One levels, I couldn't really tell you, unfortunately. But Super League, it just... It feels like it's taken a step up this year in terms of viewership. And that's not just because, okay, well, more games can be can be watched. But just on average as a whole, the league's exposure has increased, which is a great sign. And also quality of play. There are still some moments where we look at defensive aspects and think that's, that's an absolute joke. Like, the defence is poor. Because if we see an amazing, you know, amazing passing play or players stepping around others, the first thing we kind of latch onto is that the defence is poor. Sometimes it is, but sometimes you just got to acknowledge that the player used leverage extremely well to get past a player. And in one-on-one scenarios, it's difficult to just grab a player that's moving extremely quickly. Like I understand that you'd need a lot of training, but do you think that you could just grab Bevan French if he's quickly stepping left and right? You think you can just? touch him and then make sure that you hold him he'd get away there's a good chance that he'd he'd get away but um, I don't know quality of play seems to be okay I think the fact that anyone in like the top 6 or 7 in Super League right now could kind of beat anybody is a real good sign it happened a little bit last year where it was all up in the air anybody could beat anybody then it kind of settled down and Wigan look to be the better team, but as of right now, Wigan lost yesterday against Hull KR, and then before that, Hull KR got battered by Catalans. So, uh, Catalans beat Saints, Saints got beat by Warrington, Warrington got beat by Catalans. It's just, it's all up in the air at the moment, so who knows, but the quality of play, I think, has certainly improved, and I would definitely like to see, of course, improvements on the side of London Broncos. I think by the end of the year, Hopefully they will have picked up a win and that will give them some kind of, um, you know, that will be some kind of reward for the efforts. If they got it on the last last week of the season, that would probably feel, feel incredible. But yeah, just in terms of the rules, referees, IMG, quality of play, that's my thoughts at the moment. But yeah, let me know how you think everything's going at the moment.
The next topic I wanted to get onto is the Championship and League One. Now, I don't know too much about it, but I wanted to talk a little bit about restructure. And it's more of a question, really, because I don't know what the answer is down there. I don't have a clue what the answer is. Maybe you guys know, because if you watch the Championship and League One more, what's the answer going to be? Do they all need to merge into one group? Does there need to be less teams in the Championship, more teams in the Championship? Do we need to start promoting uh, NCL teams up into League One? You know, do we need to start doing that in order to, you know, have more teams in there, give them more game experience? You know, what what needs to be done in the Championship and League One? So that's more of a, a question to you guys. If you guys have an answer, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But one of my biggest concerns, and I'll incorporate Super League into this, one of my biggest concerns is that's never talked about enough. Sometimes you'll see a post on Facebook from a, a Rugby League group or something on Reddit or something on X slash Twitter asking what should we do with the Championship and League One and there's very rarely any options that are put forward it's just this many teams in this league this many teams in this league or just merge them together or when you know people ask for a restructuring of Super League how would you want it to be and the, the general consensus for what fans want for Super League is 14 teams top 8 makes playoffs you play each team twice remove loot fixtures and or well, some might still say top six playoffs, but top eight in most cases, and bottom two go down, I think is what people say. And then that's automatic promotion for first place in the championship, and then a playoffs for second place. And I completely agree with that. But then it never really focuses on the championship and, and League One. And what we've got to keep in mind, in this country, because we don't have that enthusiasm around rugby league as Australia does, we need to do more for Championship and League One. We need to do a lot more. And I'm going to kind of get onto that a little bit into like hot takes in the fan, uh, Ruby League fan questions segment about what my sort of hot take is on that. But I think if we're going to really grow the entire sport, we need a strong Championship. To the point that anyone can come in, not just Wakefield for next year, that anyone can come in and put in a good fight. And that anyone from League One can move up, and not just Oldham, even though given the investment, which is great, can go into the Championship and put up a good fight. So that the teams that aren't usually in that league can stay in that league for a couple of years. You know, that was the issue with Lee. You know, they, they managed to come up, I think it was 2015. They were like undefeated for 40 odd games, I think. It was something like that. 40 odd games come up to Super League or was it the challenge it might have been the Challenge Cup they lost to Warrington in the Challenge Cup quarterfinals that was it um, but they eventually come up and then they go straight back down but now they've had more investment better Super League level team and managed to stay up and perform extremely well at the same time you know Challenge Cup winners in the first season and playoff a playoff team so we need more like that but more needs to be done for the rest of the championship and the rest of league one in order to boost them up um i think i have an answer for that it's very very radical um but pretty sure nobody's gonna like it but we'll we'll move on to the next section so now we're moving on to hot takes and fans questions so these were submitted on the tiktok page so if you click the link in the description down below, you can go there, and if I ask for more questions, you can submit them there. But the first one to go through is from Jacob. He said that Cam Smith is the best loose forward in the league. Now, that's an interesting one, because I think there are some some great ones in there. I'm a huge fan of Benjamin Garcia. I'm a massive fan of him. What an incredible leader, because the meters he makes, the post-contact meters, the tackles, the offloads is insane especially the his stats for france during the, the rugby league world cup as well were incredible i think he's a great leader and if you you know a lot of teams they kind of need a culture change and there are a good few number 13s in the league that could really help with that and if you need a captain to kind of come in my god benjamin garcia for me is like is one of the best to bring in if you need a change in culture get benjamin garcia because i think he'd be brilliant so that's gone off topic a little bit, but Cameron Smith, best loose in the league. I would certainly say top five. I don't think that's a ridiculous shout, because who else are you comparing him to? You've got Joe Westerman, Ben Curry, 
Um, Benjamin Garcia, as I said. Morgan Knowles. It's not the most ridiculous shout. I don't think it's that insane of a statement. Because there isn't one loose forward in the league that stands out to me so clearly above the rest. So I don't find that a mental statement. I think that that's... If you're a Leeds fan... That's fine, that's understandable. And I, as a Wire fan, will praise Ben Curry and say that, oh, look at this guy. Give him some love. But it's not the wildest take in the world. But the next one is from Josh. He's asked, what's your opinion on Salford Red Devils? Salford's an interesting one because financially, they've had their good moments. Financially, they've had their bad moments. And they're in a real tricky spot right now. And, you know, they've had to offload really key players. I will say from last season, this is kind of a hot take from me, I reckon. All teams from last season, at their attacking best, on their best day, the Salford Red Devils were the most exciting and effective attacking team at their best. So consistency-wise, obviously they weren't. It was Wigan. Or was it St. Helens that had more points? Doesn't matter. But if everyone was at their best every week, Salford would have been the best attacking team. They were so fun to watch. So fun to watch. And this year, you know, they had some adjustments to make. But I think they're a real strong team. There's a decent culture around the squad. I think they're always going to be competitive week in, week out, even against the top teams. Should usually be competitive against the bottom three teams, although against Castleford and, and London so far, it's been, it's been a bit off. But the Salford Red Devils... Are, for me, are a staple of Super League and I think will remain to be so for a, an extremely long time. They've got their issues financially, but I think, you know, if IMG can keep, you know, propping up this league a bit more, the revenue can pick up, they can be a bit more financially stable. But I've never had any issues with Salford, no issues with the fans, no issues with the club, any players. They just feel like a staple of Super League, and I'm just glad that they're part of the league. The next one, from probably not George Williams. Um, two questions. Is George Williams best player for Wire this season so far? And also thoughts on Warrington putting up a bid for Jordan Abdul for a permanent move? Great questions. Is Jordan Williams best player for Wire so far this season? Almost. Almost. He's just under Matt Dufty. For me, he's just under... But the last couple of weeks, he's been closing that gap. Now, the first few weeks, it was Matt Dufty, obviously, sort of running away with it. And Williams had been out for two weeks so far this season with injuries. But in the last few weeks, he's been closing that gap to Matt Dufty. His short-range kicking game has been world-class. His ability to break the line has been fantastic. He's been taken on the line and causing a lot of issues. His decision-making has been really, really good. His general play kicking game is still absolutely atrocious, unfortunately. But... Short range kicking and just everything else. His passing, footwork has been exceptional. But for me, Matt Dufty has just offered a little bit more. But he's had two extra weeks compared to Williams. So I think by the end of the season, there's a good chance that if Williams stays on the form that he's on, that he's going to cause a lot more teams, a lot more problems. Um, the second question, thoughts on putting up a bid for Jordan Abdul? I think this is perfect, and this speaking as a Wire fan, I think this is absolutely perfect, genuinely perfect. Now the reason for this, and a lot of Wire fans will disagree with me on this one, that's fine, Leon Hayes is not as good as we're making him out to be. He is good, okay, so don't get my words twisted, Leon Hayes is a good player, but he's not as good as a lot of us are making him out to be. He's good for a 19-year-old inexperienced Super League player, but compared to other number sevens that we that we want in the league, he's not at the same level because he's got two issues in his game for me. Number one is it is general play kicking, and two is a is running game. You know, you kind of look at him, and look at him, and think, is he going to be like Rob Burrow? No, he hasn't really got that step, that change in pace. He doesn't offer that, and his general kicking 
yes, it's more accurate than Josh Drinkwater, and that's what we as Wire fans like, is that he is an improvement over Josh Drinkwater. So I, I'll take that, and I'm happy with that. But his short-range kicking game is excellent, and his timing and his passing is also excellent. As such an experienced young lad, those areas are brilliant. But the general play kicking leaves a lot to be desired, and his, his ability to run at the line is lacking. Whereas Jordan Abdul, and bear with me on this one, is a more complete player. He's got the kicking, he's got the running game, he's got the timing, the passing, the footwork. Everything that we would like Leon Hayes to have, Jordan Abdul has got it. And maybe Hayes will be better in different areas, but the general kicking game from Jordan Abdul is so effective, that is what Warrington need. We have lacked that for the last three years. We need a solid general kicking game. But it, the reason why I say it's perfect is because Jordan Abdul, of course, unfortunately, is very injury prone. So if he's to pick up an injury, Leon Hayes gets more first team game time. But it's a little bit more sporadic. So if Jordan Abdul comes in and starts, which I imagine he would in that scenario, we get a much more improved squad overall and Leon Hayes still gets to learn. So he can take his experience into the academy, hopefully build up the academy and build up the confidence of the, the players around him and maybe teach some things. But then, if there are moments where Jordan Abdul's injured, he just comes right back into the first team as a player that is ready to go for Super League and won't be the same level as Jordan Abdul, but he's still then ready to go. And hopefully in a few years' time, Jordan Abdul moves on or he retires from injury or just retires in general. Leon Hayes is ready to go. So, for me, that's... That would be a perfect move because it makes Warrington better from the start and that it gives Leon Hayes a bit more time with an excuse to not have to put him in because I don't imagine people will say drop Abdul whereas we we clearly say drop drink water, don't bring him back in but there won't then be calls to just rush Hayes back into the starting squad so for me that's a, that's a perfect move. But... The next one, who's more effective modern day prop forward or olden day prop forward? Compare. That's from Michael. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm going to make a bold statement on the back of that with a hot take of mine. Payne Haas, and granted I haven't seen all the props from like decades ago, I think Payne Haas is the most effective prop forward that has ever existed. That's in rugby league at least, okay? So bear with me, Union fans. Payne Haas is the most dangerous and effective prop forward that we've ever seen in rugby league. His ability to drag multiple players, so to get general meters, post-contact meters, his actual pace, his ability to offload so often, his footwork, his handling is all excellent. And you might want to think, well, what about Adrian Morley or Jamie Peacock? or Gareth Ellis, or other forwards that they used to play in the NRL. I'm taking, in a in an all-time team, I'm taking Payne Haas first every time. It is no debate for me, so I'm going to say modern-day prop forwards. Um, there are certainly some from, you know, a few years back. Jamie Peacock, if he'd kind of, or Adrian Morley, if they were, I guess, more up-to-date with the nutrition side of it. Maybe they didn't do it as much back then. But the pace of the game has changed, and if they sort of got used to it, I think those two obviously would be, you know, completely fine. But for me, modern day, modern day, all day. The next one is from Oliver. He says that Cass will push for playoffs. I agree. I don't think that's a ridiculous statement. I saw a couple things so far this season. I think the competitiveness against Salford in their first game, or the first time that they played Salford, I mean, um, showed that there's still life in that squad. Obviously, they were battered by Wigan in round one, and then it was at least competitive against Salford. Or that might have been round three. I apologise. I apologise if I got that wrong. Um, but competitive against a decent Salford team, then beating Salford a few weeks later, they put up a good attacking display against Warrington. Obviously, there was a few things to be desired, but they sort of threw Warrington around a little bit. And then, of course, they battered London Broncos. And people will then sort of say, well, it's only London, but... Well, FC didn't do it. Salford didn't do it. So you still have to be on it. You still have to be on top form to allow a team zero points 
and you still have to be on top form to put the points up in the first place. And with the inclusion of uh, Tex Hoy, I think he'll do wonders for that team. And he'll be in a new environment, hopefully feeling a lot happier, can play some better rugby. But yeah, I think Castleford can make a push for playoffs. Now, there's there's a few teams near the top that are really solid. So right now, the, the playoff teams for me, Wigan, Saints, Catalans, Warrington, Hull KR, and Huddersfield as of right now. But I don't see why Castleford can't compete with Lee and Leeds and Salford. But it's going to be real tricky. It's going to be very, very, very tricky. But if they keep making improvements week to week, and there are some poor performances from those other three teams that have left outside, there's a chance. It's going to be real difficult, but I don't deny that Casford can start entering that sort of conversation by the end of the season. But a good good sign for Cass so far. Next from Tom is Wigan do the treble. Interesting one, because as of right now, I think Wigan are the strongest team, even though they just lost the whole KR. So, or in terms of my power rankings, they were. So that's kind of thrown that all over the place. But that's kind of the reason why I don't think that Wigan will do the treble. Because to win all three competitions, you know, in the league, it makes sense. So Wigan might win the league leader shield, because over the course of a season, they might be more consistent. So you trust the, the stronger teams to be more consistent over multiple games. But in terms of the Challenge Cup, they've got to face Hull KR again. And they were just beaten comfortably by them. So there's no guarantee. And then they face either Huddersfield or Warrington, two teams that are on the up at the moment. And there's no guarantee against them. And Wigan haven't been that great this season. They've been you know, the, better, the best team in the league at some parts. But there's no guarantee. And then there's knockout rugby again later in the season in the playoffs. So... If they were a little bit more stable, a little bit more comfortable, then I would maybe agree with that. But the fact that the top six, maybe even seven, could beat anybody on a given day, and now including Lee, battering bloody Catalans, no, I don't think Wigan will do the treble. It doesn't mean that they can't, because they absolutely can, because of how strong that squad is. And if they get some momentum and, and some cons consistency over the next few weeks and by the back end of the season, going into playoffs, they absolutely can. But... With how sporadic the results have been, I don't, I don't think that that's possible for anybody. But it, if anybody was to do the treble this year, it should be extremely highly regarded, because yeah, results have been all over the place. Um, next one's from the Fox, not just any Fox. The Fox has said, "Would you take George King back at Wire? Rumor to be leaving KR. I would not take George King back at Wire." Um. As me and my dad refer to him as the wall. I uh, can't remember how that started. I think it was pretty much that anyone uh, that touched him was immediately stopped. Or that anyone that he touched, he then immediately stopped. But he is the wall. Um, I don't think he's that effective as a prop forward. Warrington already have enough props. Um, I think Joe Bullock finally gets a contract extension and is now hopefully going to get more game time and is appreciated now that Dudson's gone and Cassiano's gone. Um, there was talks about Oliver Partington, I think, as well, during the, the off-season. There was a new lad from Bradford. Is it Akolo, I think his name is? I'm not too sure, but recently brought in one from Bradford. Then we have Max Wood, who I think is excellent. Absolutely incredible. For 19 years old, doesn't actually look that big, but he's dragging multiple players when he gets those carries. And his debut game at home, can't remember who it was against, but he had maybe five, six, or seven carries made post contact beaters every time so that was that was fantastic but George King I don't think really fits in unfortunately um, next one is from Josh again hot take Oliver Partington is one of the best lock slash loose forwards in the league again possible I don't think there's a a defining 13 I think they're all sort of in the mix and again, I'll sort of say, well, Ben Curry with more regular minutes at 13, like when he's back from his injury, more regular minutes at 13, I think people will start to think, and this might be my bias as a Wire fan, but regular game time at 13, Ben Curry doing what he has done will be a clear number one as loose forward. But not right now. There's just so many... Uh, in line with each other. And another hot take he, he provided was Brodie Croft will make it back to the NRL. 
Possibly. Very possibly. If Rowan Smith leaves, um, there are some teams that might need a new number six. I'm trying to think of any clubs now in the NRL that need one. Broncos certainly don't. Melbourne Storm don't. The Sharks don't. Neither do the Raiders. Ooh, the Dragons. Even the Dragons don't. Maybe the Titans. Ooh, maybe the Titans, actually. Because they've got Kieran Foran. But if he was to leave, then AJ Brimson would probably take the number six role. And Jaden Campbell could then start at number one. So maybe the Titans. But it's not set in stone. Maybe the Rabbitohs. But if Cody Walker was to leave, then I think Jack Whiten would fill that number six role. So it's difficult to say, really. Maybe the Parramatta Eels, if they wanted to maybe go a different route away from Dylan Brown. Ooh, I think he could. He absolutely could because he's a fantastic player. But it's just where would he fit in right now? But of course, things can change. Anything can change um, over the next few, few years. There's also the Panthers. They might put Brad Schneider as their number six when Jerome Luai leaves next year. But he's more of a number seven, so they could go with Brody Croft. So maybe the Panthers are the way to go. And that would be quite scary, actually. Damn. Okay. Well, thank you very much for submitting your, uh, your hot takes and questions. Um, but yeah, if you have any more questions or hot takes, leave them in the comments down below. Or again, um, next time I ask for them on TikTok, post them there. But yeah, some very interesting ones there. Thanks for your questions and your hot takes. Some very interesting ones. Um, none that I wholeheartedly disagree with. None that I like think is a ridiculous statement. I can conceivably understand of some of the opinions that were put forward there. But yeah, well, thanks again. So that's going to be it for this video. I'm going to leave a sort of question of the episode, I guess. Which is, I'll just go off... The question that was most asked in this episode or that was referred to, who do you think the best loose forward is in Super League right now? Um, is there a clear one for you? Does it make complete sense that this is the go-to guy or is it too close for you to say? Let me know in the comments down below. But that is going to be it. If you have any opinions on anything I've said, have I been um, unfair towards anything, have I been fair, just let me know your opinions on these topics in general or if there's anything you want to ask me or want me to cover on the next episode, just go ahead and ask. But again... Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.